Well, good morning, good people. Morning. It's like we're starting off on time, and we're beginning this morning with uh, with Steve Jones, who's going to be talking to us about permaculture. He's, as far as I can gather, moved from a, a random and intense permacultural encounter in Zimbabwe <laughs> through um, designing a permaculture course, which has been run some 20 times now, I think, isn't it? And uh, it's yeah, also 28. 28 times. Yeah. And, um, has also a founder member of a couple of housing cooperatives uh, in the reasonable locale, the Landbutton Workhouse and Chicken Shack, both of which are still thriving. So I'd like to give you a round of applause yeah. for Steve Jones. <laughs> Thank you for the fantastic introduction, uh, Dr. Rock. Uh, it's great to be here and um, it was uh, really nice to come to the previous event and I was invited to come and talk about housing co-ops and I wanted to, I'll talk about housing co-ops a little bit more this time but I wanted to broaden it out into a slightly bigger picture as well and um, also yeah I'm, I'm also very willing to be guided by questions and things from from the floor so if anything uh, that you particularly direction you'd like to steer the conversation is in. Um, so I've called my talk Permaculture and Transition Facing the Challenges Challenge of Our Time um, because I think we do live in challenging times, we live in interesting times. Uh, we're going to get to see lots of really big changes happen in our own lifetimes and we also get to be part of that and, and to help shape that. So um, I think that's really interesting. Um, Really, it shouldn't say permaculture and transition, it should say permaculture design and transition. Because permaculture isn't just a set of ideas, it's about doing it. It's about actually taking those ideas and applying them to the world, and changing, ma making changes to the world around, around us. And some people think that permaculture is about gardening, and it's got nothing to do with gardening. But gardening is a really interesting metaphor for what permaculture is about because just as we do in our garden is we interact with the world around us and we make choices and we pull that weed, that plant up and we reinforce the other one with some compost or something. Um, <clears throat> so in an so abstract way, we're constantly gardening and everything we do, every interaction that we make with the people around us or, or with any materials, any choices that we make, we're actually influencing what the world looks like and the outcome, we're shaping how it, how it evolves and changes. And another thing that permaculture encourages us to realize is that nothing's ever the same. That the only constant that you get in life is change, right? Things are constantly changing. The sun is going up, the sun is going down. The tide is going in, the tide is going out. These are constant changes. They might follow cycles and patterns, but when the tide goes out and time comes back in again, it's not exactly the same then it's changed, right? So change is the only constant. We're constantly interacting with the world around us and by doing that, we shape that change. We create, we literally create the world that we're, that we're part of by the way that we interact with it. So permaculture is encouraging us to interact with the world in a really conscious way. And a way in which we're conscious, not about the choices that we make, but how they impact on the people around us, how they impact on society. So, and, and also, we also realise that every choice and interaction we make with other people, that happens within the wider environment, the sort of the biosphere, of which is a living, breathing system, which we're just part of. But by interacting with it, we shape it. So those are the kind of opening sort of thoughts really about what permaculture design is, is, is about. Um, I teach this stuff, it's, 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 um, you know, talks, workshops, weddings, bar mitzvahs, you name it, I'll, I'll be there and I'll do it. But really, the word permaculture was coined by an Australian ecologist, and his name's Bill Mollison. And he wrote a book, we wrote a series of books, but the book that he wrote that's really key is called Permaculture Designer's Handbook. And from that book, we've derived a course. It's, it, it's, it's, it involves 80 hours of study, and it's called a permaculture design course. And what the course contains is the knowledge that is in that book, and it's a very, very extraordinary piece of work. So it's um, 
I run these courses. I've done 28 of them now, I think. Um, mainly in mid Wales, but I do them all over the place. We hope to be doing our first one in Uganda this year. I've done them in Portugal. I originally studied permaculture in Zimbabwe. It's a global phenomenon. Um, can learn a permaculture design course is a life-changing, life-reaffirming experience for most people because it's that point when you start to turn your inner convictions into actions. You realize that, look, all this stuff I've got going on in my head, I've got to make it manifest in the world. And also is, it's the point when you stop defining yourself by, for, by what you don't like, as in, oh, I'm anti-war and I don't like the way that farms abuse animals and I don't like pesticides and I don't like nuclear no weapons and I don't like this and I don't like that. So that's actually a very negative way of defining ourselves. And, with, and through permaculture, we can actually turn that into well, no, what I do like and turn that into a positive. And then from those positives, we can actually then initiate actions and make those things happen. So it's a really, really powerful thing. And for most people, when they come to it and start studying it, it's a watershed moment in their lives. That's when they move from thinking about stuff to doing stuff. And that's what I'm here to kind of challenge us to, to think about a little bit. So um, I, I set up my own te teaching partnership. This is just runs from experience. I'm involved in housing co-ops. I've been doing permaculture for 25 years. I started out managing small farms um, in Zimbabwe and then started um, housing cooperatives. And 10, 12 years down the line, we sort of realized that we'd learned so, mu we'd learned so much from the experience and gained so much experience that we wanted to share that and that knowledge and also all the people that we'd met and the places that we now knew about because of, of the work that we've done. So um, that's, what, that's why I teach the Permaculture Design course and how I'm able to do that is because of this, this body of experience and this network of people around me um, and we want to share that and use that to empower other people. Um, one of the projects, a recent project that I've been involved with, this is based in Newtown um, it, it's, we've set up an organic horticulture training centre um, on a two and a half acre plot that we've basically been gifted uh, for 10 years. And that happened because we made a plan and we went out there and we, you know, we set it out there. But we've set up a, uh, a nursery that sells forest garden plants. We're, we're growing plants that are useful for food forests and edible landscapes and we're teaching people how to grow food and we're learning how to teach people how to grow food which is also a really interesting thing and at the, the centre in Newtown is that we have lots of different organic approaches to organic growing so th there's lots of different ways you can do this and we've got examples of all of those things there going on in Newtown and people can come in so I've been thinking about this stuff for a while and trying to create infrastructure that we're going to need to see us through the transition that we need to make and I'm going to talk a bit more about that about what that transition is and uh, what it's going to look like uh, in a minute so um, once I finish this court this uh, talk this morning I've got to jump in my car and drive over to Llan Rider, which is where I live to uh, take the keys of this property and um, this is a new housing a new housing co-op and worker co-op that we've established over the last three or four months and it's a culmination of again of sort of 20 years work um, but this is a, uh, a three bedroom house on one side and um, there's a shop, a storeroom and an office there in, in the building. And by renting out the housing co-op side for three tenants at a fair rent, one of which will be me, um, we can then afford to open the shop without having to get any money out of it. The rent's paid on the building and we'll be running it voluntary and we're going to open a local produce centre. By local produce we mean anything that we produce locally. And the highest value stuff that we'll be coming selling from our shop will just be ideas, knowledge, experience. But that will be expressed that through lovely crafts and chutneys and honey and we'll be teaching people, you know, anyway, we want a bit the heart of our own community. I don't want to get too, too sidetracked by talking about this, this, this little project, but this is just another permaculture project that we're putting in place to build a local infrastructure so that we can help facilitate a rapid transition to a low carbon sustainable future because that's the only future we have. Um, I'm also trying to assemble all these different things together. Um, I've got quite, quite strong links to um, uh, Africa, uh, to Uganda, there's a charity in Kambotlin that's been working out there for 20 years. They do amazing work. Um, we've been setting up, we've now helped set up four housing cooperatives. 
work through lots of different communities to do uh, food growing. Um, I, I, I support people to plant food in public spaces and train them how to do that. So we're also trying to link all of that together to create a permaculture design academy. In other words, to create a much more coherent way in which we can talk about what we're doing and train other people and share skills and bring people into doing this kind of stuff. So it's not just me, I'm trying to build a, build a, a really strong network around me and, and sort of structure to be able to empower people to do more permaculture and to, sh to share the learning. Because every time we do it, we, it's, it's, um, we learn something new. So I talked about this challenge of our time um, I, I wanted to throw this model in, right, and, and this little uh, thing to start off with, because this is called Conscious Camp, isn't it? Conscious, and conscious Tribal Gathering. Conscious Tribal Gathering, the sorry. Con conscious Camp. Okay, Conscious Tribal Gathering. So I thought about conscious and consciousness and what, th and I, I thought I'd try and put permaculture in that, into that perspective um, for, for this event specifically. Again, let's not just think that permaculture is about gardening, because it ain't. And I came across this model by a guy called Tim Jackson, and it's kind of, I thought it was kind of interesting, and I thought we'd spend a moment just kind of thinking about it. But what he's describing is um, a continuum, right? And we're, we're um, from one, one extreme to the other. And what, we've, what he's put on this one axis, on this little, little matrix, is the self as opposed to the other. So we can either spend time thinking about me, 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 or we can think, spend time thinking about community, 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 family, friends kind of thing, right? And he's not saying that one is right or one is wrong, but there's obviously a whole range of different positions within that extreme where we might want to place ourselves. How much time do we spend thinking about me and how much time do we thinking about we? Okay, and that's a kind of a, 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 an area that we're all working with uh, um, on a personal level. And then it's really interesting then to think about how that extreme interacts with ideas of things that are new. Ooh, bright, shiny, interesting. Gosh, let's have a look at that. What's that? Um, so the idea of a novelty and then balanced against that tradition, the stuff that we're used to seeing all the time. And we kind of take that for granted. And um, our interest in new shiny things represents our ability to adapt, to change, it's where evolution, new ideas come from. But that's counterbalanced by what we're rooted in tradition, which is to do with stability and social cohesion, and this is how things have always been, family, community, all those things are kind of built up out of tradition. So we've got a really interesting um, um, relationship between a self, community, new and shiny, old and boring, or traditional and, you know, however we might perceive that. And that to be fully balanced, we could quite easily argue that we want to kind of explore all of those spaces. We want to spend some of our time and put some of our energy into all of those different areas. We're not just thinking about ourselves, we're thinking about community. We're not just thinking short term, we're thinking long term, that kind of thing. And what Tim Jackson argues really strongly and very uh, convincingly, you can check him on uh, TED.com if you want to see the original talk, but it's obviously everything about our generation and our time that we're in is right out here somewhere. We are the iPhone generation, the selfie picture. You know, we're just obsessed with ourselves and um, sticking everything we did, our breakfast on Facebook and all this sort of stuff. So we, we We've got to admit that we're way out here, just in terms of our own emotional balance, we're not embracing the whole, the whole picture. So I thought that might be, I thought I'd just throw that in there to, um, to frame uh, some of the other stuff that I'm talking about. So, uh, yeah. Okay, really, really quick lesson in economics. I actually started out as an economics and business studies teacher, so um, I, I, it's, and, and actually it's economic decisions that underpin everything that's going on around us and that's shaping and creating the world that we are, that we see, okay? The economic, the economic model that we are all taking part of is called growth. 
the only thing if ever you listen to the mantras on the radio and the politicians and the men in suits it's jobs and growth jobs and growth money 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 jobs and growth right so what does growth mean it means the economy gets bigger and everybody's wages go up actually what growth means what we measure they is what they call gdp gross domestic product but it's just the throughput of stuff and it doesn't matter whether the outcome of that is good or bad whether it makes people happy or sad it's just the throughput of stuff that we measure and the idea that GDP money turning around is actually a good thing so if our economy gets bigger more stuff goes through that means we burn more oil we build more roads we drive more cars we cause more pollution all of the things that actually we attach to economic activity involve consuming resources and emitting pollution and if we keep it and not only that though is <clears throat> and here's a really interesting and simple mathematical problem that illustrates this point of um, exponential growth exponential growth means simply something that is growing at a regular rate like two percent a year doesn't sound very much does it two percent a year two percent economic growth in fact if our economy isn't growing at three percent a year we've got problems because people can't afford to pay the interest on the loans and the stuff that they've you know they've borrowed and stuff so really what we would like is four percent growth a year in the economy and this is really interesting because there's a mathematical formula you can use and something that's growing at four percent a year if you divide that number by 70 that gives you the time that it takes for it to double it gives you the doubling time so something that's growing at four percent a year doubles in size every 17 and a half years so if I grow our economy at 4% after 17 and a half years we need to consume twice as much oil and twice as much steel and coal and everything like that just in that and then here's how this graph works is in the next 17 and a half years it doubles again so after 35 years our economy would be four times bigger than what it currently is not twice as big four times as big and then the next time it doubles it's eight times as big you see how this graph slowly slowly climbs from zero to five it takes it six years to get to five and yet on the seventh year it's at ten and on the eighth year it's at twenty it rapidly expands now you probably remember you'd be from from school even being told that thing about the frog on a lily pad and the lily pad doubles in size each day and at what time does it cover the whole pond? Have you heard that thing? You remember that? I like to put this a slightly different way. You know what a Petri dish is, don't you? Like they use in, in, in laboratories. And it's, uh, so it's like a defined environment. So you can think of it like a saucer. And you put on that saucer agar jelly, which is food. It's like stock or something like that. Or, you know, like soup or something. You know, like, so we put some food on a defined environment, finite environment. And I... And we put one bacterium on there, which is microscopic, you can't see it, tiny little bacteria, we put one bacteria on there. And the rule is, that bacterium can double in size every minute. When we put the first drop on, it's midnight on Monday. When we go back at midnight on Tuesday, it's completely covered the dish. So at what time was the dish half full? Two. one minute two so it took 59 minutes to get to be half covered and then on the 60th minute it's fully covered so with five minutes to go there was only 16 percent of the dish was being used by the bacteria do you think at that point the bacteria said oh we're running out of space because we've used 16 percent of the environment five minutes later double 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 bang gone everything gone totally used up so guess what happens is I'm in my laboratory and I think oh look it's used up that space I look around and I find three more Petri dishes and I load them up put the, the soup on it and I put them next to it and I think okay now I've got four times the resources how much longer do I get two minutes, two minutes. It's exponential growth the maths is cruel you cannot have exponential growth in a finite world it's impossible 
We have an economic system that is impossible. It cannot keep growing. And because it can't grow anymore, because we physically reached the limits of the planet, it's now consuming itself. It's liquidating all the assets and turning them into stocks and bonds and all this sort of stuff. Our economy is eating itself. And <clears throat> what we have to realize is that that period of time, that economic model that we grew up with and what we regard as normal does not exist anymore. It already doesn't exist anymore. We're in a new world, we're in a new paradigm. <clears throat> okay. It's not just the climate change thing and the fact that CO2 levels have jumped from 275 parts per million to 400 parts per million in just a hundred years. It's the, also is we're removing the living part of the planet. We're chopping down the, 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 the plants and polluting the natural bit, which is the bit that cleanses and maintains the atmosphere. So we're attacking, we're actually like an autoimmune disease. That we're, again, the way that our economic system is behaving is we're attacking the very part of the planet that sustains us. We're undermining the atmosphere, the things that create it, and we're toxifying it by dumping all of the CO2 into it. So we, you know, so we seriously have a carbon problem. And these are all the different scenarios and things that the, 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 the scientists and whatever are, are giving us. Um, and so if we carry on as we are, if we think that we can carry on along economic growth models, the kind of thing that the government is locking us into right now is we're going to be way, way past the, the two degrees of, of climate change that we've, we've said we, uh, we're committed to try and stay within. Um, this is certain death, this scenario, if we, we go that way. The, the only way we, re we can go is the blue line. We have to do this. And it'll happen whether we do it deliberately or whether it's forced on us. It, it'll happen one way or the other. So we realise that this is where we have to get to. Um, and we have to take responsibility, people. It's us that have to do this. Not the government aren't going to do it for us. Corporates aren't going to sell it to you. You have to do it. You have to ask yourself, how am I going to live a low carbon lifestyle and how am I going to empower everyone around me to do the same? And, and you need to get busy on that as soon as you can because we don't have long. We're right in the moment. So right now the global economy is eating itself. Um, on the big picture stuff is, where does a lot of this CO2 come from? And what's really interesting is, well, a hell of a lot is it from electricity and there's a whole lot of stuff we can do around producing electricity from uh, renewables. 10% of it comes from agriculture, 10%. And nearly 30% is transportation. So you put those two things together, right? This is, these are the areas where we're most exposed. These are the areas where we'll struggle to carry on producing, make these things happen in our low carbon um, economy is we produce our food in a very, very energy intensive way. That's all the combine harvesters and petrochemicals and fertilizers and all this stuff's made out of oil. Um, and then we ship our food around, we transport it around. We're going to really, really struggle to feed ourselves in a low carbon world. We're going, or let's put it another way is, we're going to, we're going to struggle to feed ourselves in the way that we have been feeding ourselves. It's very easy to make grow food, but you have to do it, you have to actually apply yourself to it, it doesn't happen by itself. So I, um, there's a really, really, really big area uh, to, in thinking about our own personal transition and in thinking about how to insulate ourselves from the inevitable changes that happen around us is we need to get involved with producing food. Even if that's just making compost or finding out if you've got a local farmer's mart or whatever, 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 get, you know, but just start to get yourself involved in that. And the other thing is, is try and arrange your life so you're less dependent on transportation. Car clubs, car sharing, you know, work from home, Skype, you know, these are, we seriously, seriously got to think about this stuff. Um, so yeah, this, there's now tons of reports. The United Nations Conference on Trade and Development put a massive report out two years ago. I don't understand why everybody isn't talking about it, but it just says that the kind of farming systems that we do, large scale monoculture, systems are really vulnerable to climate disruption 
because if you've got 40,000 hectares of one crop and the weather changes, you get a complete failure. And we, we, we could, by carry on down the sort of centralized ways of doing things that we are currently do, you, using, we're looking at things potentially just failing completely. Um, so it, 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 it's really obvious that we need to decentralize. We need to do a lot more of what we do locally and we need to produce it from local resources and we need to do it in kind of organic, energy efficient kind of ways. Um, you know, <laughs> we're also eating the wrong kind of food, you know. Um, uh, uh, this, well, these are figures from 1980 to 2008, so that's a 30 year period just about. And obesity, prevalence of obesity in men has jumped from 5% to 25% in 30 years, that's extraordinary isn't it? In women, similar proportion, and look at the kids. Kids is off the scale, they've gone from zero to 20% of boys, I don't believe that. 20% of boys aged four to 12 are technically obese. And I'll tell you why, is we're just eating the wrong food. We're eating the wrong food, it's high fructose corn syrup, actually it's processed food, that's what's causing obesity, exactly that. Um, but if you actually remind ourselves of the food pyramid, we're supposed to eat lots and lots of this stuff at the bottom, and these are our occasional treats at the top. And you can eat as much leafy greens as you want. In fact, the more you eat, the better. There's no like getting obese on leafy greens. You just eat as many as you want. If those are growing at your back door organically, what you're doing with your neighbors is, the basis of your diet is already in place. The next layer is all fruits and vegetables and tubers. These are high water, high nutrient types of food. These are the ones that are really easy to grow ourselves next to where we live. All this other stuff, it's hard to do grains and pulses and things on, on a small scale. Herbs and sp spices we can do. And then we start getting fish and meat. Again, gets a bit more specialist up here. So there's a massive opportunity to produce a lot of what we need locally and um, with local resources. So. And also the figures about how in our society um, people are in increasingly excluded and lonely because we're not, we're not connected to each other. So when I go out and talk to people and I think about this, I, was, I thought let, let's, let's actually start focusing on some really clear objectives about what we want to do rather than just going, oh, the world's the sky is falling and all this sort of stuff is change, is permaculture principle number 12, change creates opportunity. We are in an era of opportunity because it's, we're going to see a whole shitload of change, right? And by knowing that and by understanding that and by being kind of ahead of the, the game on that, we, we can actually like surf that wave. It can be exciting. But at the same time, let's be really, let's start to think about some specific things to focus on so that we, we, we've got a, you know, we know what we're aiming at. And I, I think this thing about food is, is, is pretty important. Um, and I think that it doesn't need a number, but let's just put one on it. We should grow a third of our food, of what we eat should come from, not from our own garden, but from within our community, right? And that's the, the high water, high nutrient stuff. So we collect the water off our roof, we compost our waste, we build nice soil, we grow, f it's, not, well, it's, not, it's not hard, is it? And we, we commandeer public spaces traffic circles, the, 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 the dead council bits of ground that they mow every 10 days and nobody does anything with. We commandeer those spaces. We turn those into public food growing spaces. <laughs> we put um, food forests in there. Um, this is cultivating Newtown. This is um, you know, where we, we propagate plants. We're building up the numbers of plants so we can, we can supply people. And we're also training people how to do it. So say so, these aren't just words. We're putting these things in place. We're doing it. We're exploring all different kinds of growing systems. That's a 1.2 meter square bed. That's all it is, 1.2 meter squared. And we've stacked up about five different yields in there. And it's just growing on compost, which is made out of food waste. So this is like, this ain't rocket science. We can grow a, a ton of food in a very small space, um, especially if we work together and help each other out a little bit. So I wanted to take my proposition that a third of our food could be grown locally. I want to take that a bit further. And I say that a third of our food should be grown locally, but it should trade outside of the money economy. In other words, we give it away. 
or we swap it. Hey, do you want to look after my kids this afternoon? Here's a lettuce or here's a bunch of carrots. This is the kind of relationship. Here's community relationships. And actually, we can rebuild community relationships by using um, alternative currency systems like let's. We can create cryptocurrencies. I don't know if you know about Bitcoin, but the whole world is changing. We can create our own money. Did you know that? You can create your own money. And you, if you then are creating value yourself by growing stuff and processing stuff and storing things and drying things in, you can then use your own money to facilitate that train. So it doesn't matter, well it doesn't matter, but is we can insulate ourselves, we can create some other support mechanisms outside of the globalized financial system, because as I said again, it is currently eating itself. So I, I don't think we can totally rely on that. So one third of our food needs to be grown locally and it needs to change hands for community currencies. That, and then that will give us food resilience. And we'll real build the ecologies around our houses and all the sparrows and the starlings will come back because we'll actually be some insects for them to eat. Um, so just by taking care of ourselves, permaculture principle, we're taking care of ourselves, but we're doing it in a way in which we're taking care of community and we're understanding that we're within a wider environment that's a living, breathing system, right? So by our approach to food growing suddenly builds a relationship to our community and to the environment around of us, rather than us just going to Tesco's and buying some shit wrapped in plastic and going home and eating it, which is what we are currently doing. Um, so yeah, I think there's a whole ton of new opportunities and everyone should go away and start a new business, a new community interest company, start a cooperative, think about food security, think about food security as a way to create social inclusion. We need to create pathways back into community for all those people who are isolated from it. All those old people sat there with their tin of spam, you know, on their own in their house or, or people perhaps who have been sick and need to be rehabilitated or people who have been socially excluded because of perhaps behavior problems. All of those people, you know, and children and uh, everybody actually. Um, social inclusion by um, uh, inviting people to come garden with us and grow food and build that thing. So we need to think about food waste, we need to think about how that relates to wildlife and diversity and, and use that as a strategy yeah, to reclaim and take ownership of public spaces because they're ours, you know, and we just let the, 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 the nothing happen to them. So um, just a few examples. Um, I just happened to be in Amsterdam uh, a couple of weeks ago and I just got this lovely picture of uh, a, a wisteria, I think, climbing up the building. I'm just thinking about the potentials in urban spaces with all these surfaces and edges and, and, and the water that's trapped within that system. We can, we, can, we can change what whole places look like by introducing plants and living, living environment. Um, actually, this was another um, one in Amsterdam, but this is a, a chocolate vine, the Kibia canata. It, 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 it's again growing up a building similar to that, not really taking any space. It's edible. It creates not only food for people, but food for insects and food for birds. We could, we could, we could, we could transform cities and environments just by starting to bring really interesting plants and back in into those spaces right we can we can grow food you don't need gardens we have the space already these these outside and edge spaces they belong to everybody and nobody we just reclaim them just take possession of it nobody objects when you do this stuff everybody goes wow that's fantastic you know uh, so i take a lot of inspiration these are the atlas mountains in morocco um, these people have been up here for centuries and centuries and centuries. They're gardening every single inch of the landscape. They've got um, uh, terraces going right up to the snow line and they've got and, and right down at the whole of the mountain. So um, when, when, um, when, when they're, and these are all orchards, these are all fruit trees, and, uh, and they underplant them, they grow um, cereals underneath them. And then by the time the trees come into leaf, they can crop the cereals, which they use to feed their donkeys and, and themselves, and then the fruit comes. And the fruit comes, you can see the microclimate because it comes sequentially each terrace as the season moves on, because it, each, each, each 10 meters of height is a degree of latitude. Um, so they have a farming system that is fully resilient to climate change because it takes in every single climate. So the, the climate can vary and they'll have super productive 
this section or super productive this section, they've got food resilience. And also, it's, all of their settlement is below, so much of it is below where they live. So all the water runoff and the nutrient runoff and all animal manure and food waste gets composted and trapped in these beds below it. That's food resilience. These guys are at least 600 years ahead of us in terms of having a safe food supply. That's why I think we need to get busy. Um, this is a roof garden in Reading. It's a place called Reading International Solidarity Centre. It's on top of a conference uh, centre. I, I, I built that together with a group of people in 2002. We put 176 species of edible and medicinal plants on the roof of a building. It's now 13 years old and it's just awesome, you know. So again, these are the potentials of what we could be doing just, just in urban spaces. Imagine what we're doing in rural spaces. Um, um, we've got to realise the, um, the only limit is our own imagination. We need to get out there and we need to turn the world, our planet, into the Garden of Eden that it wants to be. It wants to look like this. It wants to be super abundant. Provide us with not everything, but really significant a harvest of what we would do. This is a, a Chinese toothache tree. It's a kind of Sichuan pepper. And we just put it in for a bit of fun, you know, a few years ago, because it was slightly novel, you know. It's now giving us pounds and pounds of what we realize is a really valuable spice. This is the kinds of things that we, sh you know, so easily can be doing. Um, this is Tambuckland Workhouse. This is another sort of dead space that we, as a community, we took ownership over and we've started to apply permaculture principles and see it grow and develop. Um, anyone could do this. This is um, outside a shopping centre in Liverpool. I work with a community on a housing estate. There's that same raised bed idea. Um, going out onto a council estate, there's 7,000 people living on a dormitory estate outside of Liverpool, a place called Stockbridge Village. And um, we worked with the community, we planted 450 fruit trees in amongst their houses. They've got 30 acres of grass there that the, that the council just mows every 10 days. And no one does anything with it. So we try, start to turn it into a garden. Um, I think, you know, get the, get, get the folks out of the houses and get them busy digging, you know. They love it. They, they, they you know. Uh, um, so I built up a little team of people, uh, of guys of this state, and we went around that little kind of like guerrilla gardening, just throwing up fruit trees everywhere. We had a tiny bit of funding to do it, but nearly everything was done voluntarily. And um, they just wrote to me actually saying, but about 85%, 80, 85% of what we've planted is still there two years later. So yes, some got vandalized. Yes, some got snapped. Yes, some got nicked. But do you know what? Most of them are still there. And we just stuck them anywhere. I mean, not, you know, we obviously thought about it a little bit, but we, and we, we asked the council, which is actually the housing association, and they just they told us how they mow the lawns, so you had to understand what their machines look like and stuff. But they said beyond that, you have carte blanche. Just because we asked, they said yes. So don't assume that the answer is no. And in fact, if you don't ask, then no one can say no, can they? It's like, what's not to like? Oh, I provided a fruit tree in a public space. Shoot me, you know. <laughs> what's the worst thing that could happen? And if you propagate them yourselves, they don't even cost anything. Like fruit trees, it's grafting. You get a bit of root and you get a bit of tree and you join them together and then next year you've got a one year old whip and that's what they look like. And you can go and plant them out in a public space. Um, for example, but you know, um, you know, kids respond to it. So why aren't we growing food in schools? Why isn't one third of the, well, all the fruit, the five a day and all this, why isn't that coming out of the, the school gardens? Because if you go and you work with the schools and you get the kids, they're showing me their dirty hands. They're so proud. They've got the, the first time they've ever had a positive association with having dirty hands. I'm trying to change the way people feel about their relationships by doing this, really. I'm not so worried about the trees and whether they get apples off it or not. I'm trying to change the people because that's what has to happen. It's not a permaculture isn't so much a set of techniques. There is a whole bunch of techniques, but really. It'll only happen if people, it's from the heart, right? Which is why I put the map of the human heart at the beginning. We have to change. We have to not just think short term, we have to think long term. We have to not just think me, we have to think we. We have to embrace all of that reality. And um, these, these kids are planting a tree to commemorate one of their brethren who died. And they're creating a quiet place where they can go and sit and remember their friend. We thought it was a really, really beautiful thing to do. And again, trying to connect people 
to real things instead of our whole virtual world and everything is we, we, we're all part of a biology of the planet um, this is doing the same with people from an old age home um, so many people in long-term care I hadn't even really realized especially in big council estates you know live whatever but, but we're socially distressed areas you end up with lots of not very healthy people even just in their 50s and 60s and get them outside and get them involved in doing this stuff and the hot, it transforms their their mood and we didn't just show people how to plant trees we showed them how to make chutney but not only that is we had events where we handed out biscuits with the chutney on and you know so they actually got eaten and used and celebrated we can all do this. We don't need any special permission to do this. We can just do it. This is a, a garden, a community garden that we designed in, in Newtown. And, you know, we went away and built it. And, and people were, so this was just behind our, on an estate. It's behind a compost factory on, a, on an industrial estate. And, and we built this thing, put a little roundhouse in it. And everybody just, people liked it so much, we actually got funding to do this, where, the, where the Cultivate project came from. Um, so again, is wherever there's an unused resource, there's an opportunity. Bit of land. There's no such thing as waste. Permaculture teaches us: you study nature, there is no such thing as waste. So wherever you see something that's unused, there's your opportunity. Unused bit of land. This garden was made out of what other people regard as rubbish. We made healthy topsoil out of it. Um, compost toilets. There's no such thing as waste, right? Actually, why are we... I mean, this is how crazy, how detached we are from the real world is. We're scared of our own shit. And we've constructed a massive industry and thousands of miles of pipes and God knows what, pumping stuff around. Oh, because we don't know how to compost. It's that easy. It's really, really easy to compost toilet. And then you've got a resource that you can feed your fruit trees with. It's not rocket science, you know? This is, um, I think, these last two slides are from, from um, um, uh, Kamuli in, uh, oh, sorry, in Gora, sorry, in, um, in Uganda. And I just want to say, you know, think globally, act locally, and all that is. These guys out there, I mean, Uganda, amazing place. 70% of the people still live in rural areas in mud huts, and they grow 90% of their own food organically and locally. They know more about sustainability than we ever could, really. Uh, but at the same time, they have lots of stresses and pressures on them and they're rebuilding their country after a period of, of massive instability that went on for a long period of time. So this is a project um, encouraging people to diversify their crops and diversify their incomes. And we're using the same ideas that we're using in Liverpool or anywhere else. It's all permaculture thinking. But, um, these people have attended a training day um, at the centre and because they've attended it, they get a mango tree. And they get that mango tree and the only condition is that they take it home and they plant it and then once they've planted it they can come back uh, to the project and they can get a turkey turkey <laughs> that turkey can eat the rotten mangoes that they can't eat and other food waste and they can treat it almost like a pet I mean they do you know they really uh, but when that turkey is fully grown they can take that turkey when they want if they want to back to the project and they can sell it and the money they get is enough to buy the components to make a 30 watt solar voltaic panel and they can attend a workshop where they make that panel so now they can go home and they can charge their cell phone because they have a higher cell phone take up in Uganda than we do because nobody there's no other form of communication so they've got all our old throwaway phones that we all threw away and they're running their whole country on it They've actually created, I'm talking about money systems, in Uganda they have created a money system that doesn't involve banks and they use their mobile phones. So I can text from my phone to you, I can send like a barcode and I can text credit to you. So I can text five pounds of phone credit to you and you can either use it on your phone or you could go into like a, a little shop and they'll turn that into cash for you, charge you a few pence for that or you can keep it on your phone and when you want to buy something from somebody else you can text it to them so that doesn't go through the bank doesn't go through the exchequer and or I can go three days to market sell my uh, my stuff in the market and then I can text the money back to my village not through the bank but through my mobile phone that's how smart these people are they're not living in the stone age I'm telling you they're ahead of us 
they're really innovating right so we went from the mango tree which was just um, propagated seedling that's you know somebody made 2,000 of those in one day working away or a little team of guys that, we, that have been trained up um, then you get the turkey chicks again this is a very very small amount of money but the villagers care for the turkey and that gives the, 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 the project that they sell the turkey back to they make a profit on that as well and the villagers get solar panel and then suddenly ding they're part of the 21st century their kids this is on the equator right so that it goes dark at 6 p.m. So how the hell do the kids do their homework? It's a real limiting factor if you don't have light and they cannot afford, a candle would be too expensive. Um, so now they can have a little LED light that the kids can read by and the mum can charge her, uh, her phone up on and she can go to market and participate in the global economy. That's the power of permaculture, is thinking it's understanding economics and energy and food and, and living and bringing all those things together. It's not just gardening right so um, that's it um, you can follow me on Twitter if you like or um, get on my website or anything else but you know come on a course our next course sell this is the advert commercial um, our next p full pump culture design course is going to be in clan rider um, we've just opened our new co-op in clan rider we're going to be running it on the small holding of uh, some friends of ours who've He's a yurt maker, and she's an artist and a, and a, and a grower. So it's, and, and it's about a quarter of a mile from where where we live and where where, where the, our co-op is. And there's two other co-ops in the valley as well that we'll be taking you to. So um, we're running this PDC. It starts, I think, the 20th of September, and it goes through to the 4th of October. Um, it's camping. We'll feed you. We'll take care of you. Get to see everything, and um, it'll change your life. <laughs> That's the commercial. Tell your friends. Uh, it starts on the 20th of September. It runs for two weeks. It's, it sounds like a long time, but when you get there, two weeks is nothing, because this is a big subject. And this is something that's gonna set you on course for the rest of your life, right? Permaculture gives you a, 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 a way of framing and understanding these, these things that I've talked about, so you can actually act on them, and actually move forward to it, and also be able to talk to other people about it, so they can understand, you know, you can, you can share your experience. Otherwise, we're all just flailing in the wilderness, going, "Oh, I don't like this and I don't like that." You know, we got to we got to do something about it. It's the full price is six hundred pounds. The r low income price is four hundred and fifty. Sounds like quite a lot, but we we accommodating you for two weeks and feeding you. If money, if you really want to do the course and money is a problem, then come and talk to us because there's other ways to to do it. Um, we fundraised for two, we did a crowdfunding campaign on the last course to get some people through. And sometimes we just ask for donations or sometimes we do work exchanges. So don't let money be the reason you don't come. But obviously we're trying to, we have to meet our costs. And um, <coughs> we'll interestingly be increasingly interested in accepting part payment in cryptocurrency and, and in local currencies. I, I seriously think there is big, big future to be had about thinking about community owned controlled currencies and we'd be um, really wrong of us not to accept them. And uh, we did do a trial launch actually of the Dolith. We have already printed a thousand notes of our currency, but um, that's another story. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Sorry. I. It's a really good question, isn't it? it Yes. That is what I was, yeah, thinking of. But how much energy do you have to pour in to melt it down? Yes, it would be negative. It wouldn't. It, it, it depends on which form it comes to you. So if you, if you it's, but okay, the the first part of the answer is we need to stop producing it. And I actually see a lot of plastics is actually a byproduct of oil industry. We have the the feed to stock chemicals for it because of oil refining. So we're actually trying to deliberately find uses for those chemicals. 
that's part of the reason. So that's why it's so cheap and so ubiquitous. Um, if we could, if there was a way to start to, to to turn that around, so that yeah, we could we could harvest the plastic out of the environment and turn it back into something usable. You know, that would kind of solve it. But really, we've got to stop producing that. I mean, it's it's a problem. It's stuff's everywhere, and it could turn out to be the thing that undoes us. It's because it can. These little plastic bees can then concentrate up food chains, and it's serious. From my understanding, you can make plastic from hemp, which is why it's great. That's right. Oh yes. No, we can definitely do alternative to plastics, um, but the plastic that we already chucked out in the environment, you know, it's a pro it is a problem. Uh, we need to stop producing it. Yeah. One of the things that people seem to neglect quite a lot is uh, energy saving products. So if we can reduce the amount of energy we need, I looked into uh, radiator panels. Yeah. Uh, you stick on the wall and they insulate the wall from the radiator. Yes. And they reduce heat loss. Mm. And they reckon they will save 20% on the mm. price of that. Now, if you say that 20% of a thousand pounds even, that's 200 quid a year. And these things at the time are costing like 60 quid, mm. as well, but you know, if anything that will pay for itself in two years has got to be a good product. Other things can take 20 years, but it's still mm. sold as energy saving. Mm. One of the things that does seem to work, and I tested it out on a rolling load in a kit car, is magnet fuel deionizers. Uh, mm. And what happened was, with the fuel deionizer in it, it was chucking out 140 day horsepower. It took it out, it was doing 120, put it back in 140. Where's the 20 day horsepower coming from? It's chucking out more energy for the same amount of fuel. And it had to be set the time it was set for the top dead centre, so it's a little mm -hmm. bit of fuel in the way. Do we could use those things? Energies are a really big subject. It's a really, really big subject. So, and it's hard to just do it like a quick two minute on it sort of thing. But, um, yeah, the reality of it is if we move to renewables as fast as we possibly can and try and stay under two degrees of climate change, we will end up with one sixth of the energy that we currently use. So we are forced, we have to find really coherent, low energy ways of doing things. But it's beyond technology, we actually have to redesign our lifestyles, the way that we behave to, 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 to get to where we need to go. But you're right, there's tons of stuff that could be done and that we should be having those kind of dialogues going on around us and within our communities and stuff all the time. You know, we should be taking this stuff really seriously because it's the future of the planet we're talking about here in terms of climate change. It's a big deal. Saving money obviously being a, an important impact of that. But there's a, there's a lot of... And, yeah, we need to be energy educated and we're not. And and given, give me another workshop and I'll give me another hour and I'll, I'll you know... <laughs> the thing is, is that, I mean, uh, the thing to sell it to the masses most mm. people is the money saving side of it. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that people are sure. interested in. They're already asked about whether it's going to affect mm. the climate. They're interested in saving mm -hmm. money. Mm. And that's quite an easy I, but I, I'm not. I'm not actually. I mean, I get. I get you. I get what you're saying, and and, and that's an important point. But I, I want to just say something. And again, I'm here doing a talk, so I want to be thought provoking. I want to just go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But is let's put it another way. Is I'm not interested in persuading anybody anything. You know, I'm not. I'm not campaigning for this stuff. It's. It's. I'm talking about physics. We're talking about gravity, right? These are, these are fundamental facts. So either you prepare yourself for the reality that energy is going to become scarce and expensive, food is going to become scarce and offensive, or you're just going to suffer really badly. And not just wake up. So I say, rather than actually go on oh, campaign, ban out, save the planet, it's always, just seriously, start to think about saving yourself. And start to think about, but doing that in a way, not at the expense of other people, but in a way in which you can help other people. So go out and find out about your energy saving things and fit them in your house and tell your neighbour about it. You know, actually turn these things into actions. And don't worry about the rest of the world, start with you. Because the other thing that permaculture teaches you, right, I have the whole world and all these big scary global issues is, guess which part of the universe I'm most in control of? Me. Right? So the change starts here. And the change even starts here inside my mind, in my consciousness, so I'm making a decision is, I don't want to be part of the problem, I want to be part of the solution. I want to actually make a positive impact. And hopefully, I want to enjoy that process as I do it. So that's where I'm focusing, not in a selfish way, but in an empowering way. Yeah.
It certainly. Mm. Yeah. But, but the council has a duty. You have a duty as a citizen to give them a hard time, you know, to get on their case and to press for it because it won't happen if you don't press for it. And the more you press, the more momentum will gain around that. Yes. We need to seize control of our public spaces. We pay for it, it's ours. Mm. No, I just mean being assistant. Yes. There's a thing called lunch. Yeah, that's not the aggro. We don't necessarily need to get 10 people. All you do is literally just talk with the council and, you know, and, and put out to them mm. you're supporting them. You're supporting them, look after that area. Yeah. You're, do, you're doing them a favour. That's what's worked for us, Alexa. Yeah. Well, the minimum number is actually 8 people. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And uh, there's other things called land shares as well. Mm. So if you talk to someone who might have a big garden, can't do most of it. A link back to something that I was saying earlier though, actually growing food is a skill and it's not that easy and it really helps to do it as a group and with, you know, t um, so yeah, people have allotments and then find that they, you know, they, they struggle with it. I don't know how to So, so yeah, we, we definitely need a community team effort, and the more momentum we can create around that, then we'll, you know we'll create a snowballing effect. So yeah. Yeah, what's lovely about in Wrexham, they, we talked to the council about it, and they did talk about you know us, us dividing land and allotments, and we were like, that's just so much trouble. You've got to work out rent, whatever. So instead, we just all grow together, and all the food, all the food is free, and that just mm. means. Working allotments really hard. It's a lot of hard work to keep doing it, but you you get about eight people or even three or four together, and then just a lot gets done all at once. Or one person who really knows how to garden, who then tells everybody, you know, <laughs> yeah. guides and share or well, shares that knowledge with other people. Yeah. But we found that with, with our Newtown model, what we've done in Newtown is, if anybody lives in Mid Wales, go go to Newtown and visit Cultivate because if you're interested in food growing, there's, there's a lot of knowledge there. As a woman there called Emma Maxwell who teaches. Um, uh, organic horticulture to people who you know who want, who want to start growing food. There's a lot of there's a lot to learn, but it's a real fun journey learning it. Yeah. Correct. Mm. We, we run seed saving courses in Newtown and, and encourage people to do that, yeah. What is it, something blue? It's an organisation on the net and they will give you seeds and then five years time you give them back the same amount of seeds but you also give... Well there's the Heritage Seed, it, seed Company it, and there's, yeah, there's, yeah there's, there's a whole world of fantastic stuff going on in, in food growing and really great networks to link into but having some land helps, yeah. Yeah. Right, you can reuse it and yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, part part of the solution is by having very t again, as if we if, if if production was more localized, we could then it's much easier to recycle things and to keep things separated. There is a lot that we can do with that. We can certainly we can. I mean, we, we're so resource inefficient currently. We could only easily do a lot better, you know. Um, but I think there's something bigger going on. I think that we're seeing the end of the sort of real consumer-driven economy, actually. 
and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But um, it will challenge us in lots of un, un ways that we haven't predicted. But yeah. Yes. You know, the cross. Yes. And you were saying that we were way up there somewhere. And I was thinking about what well, would be the ideal place for us to be on that cross. Well, I think we have to be not in I was one. thinking like probably bang in the middle. Well, yes, and I think really it's sort of saying though that we need to occupy the whole of this area. Yeah. So because we need to, we do need to spend some time thinking about ourselves, but not at the expense of thinking about other others. Um, if, we, if we imagine ourselves in the middle of that, mm. I mean that represents all sorts of things, the, the directions and all sorts. Of things. We put ourselves bang in the middle of that, and then imagine the whole thing spiraling yes. into whatever, wherever mm. we're going. Yes. That makes quite a nice image for me. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, I like that. Yes. So we begin a journey where we explore all of these spaces yeah. and 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 and. and, and the whole thing because it's yes what a lovely thought Jess we'll, we'll close with that thank you very much for that <laughs> <laughs>